This is Story Recapped. Today, I'm going to explain an action, drama, sci-fi film called V for Vendetta. Set in a dystopian England, a phantom arises and seeks vengeance for what the government has done to him and the people. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. A government should be of the people, for the people, and by the people. But what should one do when the very institution created to protect its citizens causes suffering? In this dystopian future, one nation's people have given up much of their freedom to live comfortable lives, now living under an iron fist regime. Privacy has all but vanished. However, the promised utopia is now being haunted by the corpses it's built upon. Evie is preparing to head out for the evening. At the same time, a man donning a gray fox mask also prepares. The TV plays a talk show with the host, Prothero, speaking his mind. He speaks of the former United States of America and how it has decayed into war and anarchy. He's proud that Britain has managed to maintain its prosperity and blames America's downfall and godlessness. He then recalls when Britain itself was tested by God and says that it has to rid the country of people with different religions, differing races, and homosexuality. Outside, she runs into Fingermen, footmen for Norsefire, the nation's ruling political party. Evie immediately apologizes, but the men grab her, planning to do the unspeakable. But the masked man appears. He quotes Hamlet before taking out a dagger. The men attack him, but he dodges each blow gracefully. The masked man successfully disables the fingermen one by one before turning to Evie. The man then enters an elaborate monologue, telling Evie who, what, and why he is, but finishes by introducing himself as V. V then invites Evie to a concerto he's attending. Evie, still shaken by what happened, reluctantly agrees. In this dystopian future, the United States has collapsed, and Britain appears to be one of the few nations that managed to survive a global catastrophe. Britain has fallen under a totalitarian government run by the Norse Fire Party. Curfews are in effect, fingermen roam the streets, and people live comfortable but restricted lives. Evie agrees to join V, probably as thanks for his rescue. But V's bravado, charisma, and strangely captivating eloquence make it hard to refuse. V dons a Guy Fawkes mask. This mask has long been a symbol for Guy Fawkes, a Christian revolutionary who, on November 5th, 1605, sought to destroy Parliament along with all the lords in an attempt to displace King James with a Christian ruler. In this world, Fox's mask could be a symbol for those who oppose the government. They arrive atop a building in front of the Old Bailey, and as the church bells ring, November the 5th begins. V then takes out a conductor's baton and begins conducting a non-existent orchestra. To Evie's surprise, music slowly fills the air. The music seems to be coming from the street's public announcement system, playing Tchaikovsky's 1812 overture. As the crescendo hits, explosions and fireworks fill the night sky. Evie watches in horror as the buildings collapse, with the music blaring, while V is in complete ecstasy, laughing maniacally. Later. Chancellor Sutler and the prominent members of the Norse Fire Party discuss the Bailey's destruction. Sutler is infuriated, demanding answers from the Fingerman leader, Mr. Creedy. Creedy responds, saying all witnesses have been detained. The head of citizen surveillance, Mr. Etheridge, is tasked to blacklist the 1812 overture, banning it in all forms of media. Mr. Dascom, the one in charge of the media, comes up with the cover story and will be informing the people that the Old Bailey had to undergo an emergency demolition. V and Evie were captured on surveillance cameras, and the lean inspector, Mr. Finch, is working on identifying and capturing them. Sutler stresses the importance of finding the culprit as his actions are threatening everything that they built. V had destroyed the Old Bailey in celebration of the 5th of November. Demolishing a building is a tremendous undertaking, and it appears that V had managed to do it all on his own. The music playing on the intercom suggests that he's also able to hack into the government's mainframe. It's noticeable that Creedy had detained witnesses, and Sutler asked to blacklist the 1812 overture. Both of these, paired with Dascom's media manipulation, indicate that Norsefire has the entirety of its citizens under control. Lying to the public to avoid mass hysteria seems to be the primary goal for Sutler. It's also worth noting that Sutler seems to be threatened by just one individual's actions, indicating that they could be hiding something. In the source material, the Chancellor's name is Adam Susan. It's changed to Adam Sutler in the film to invoke similarities to the name Hitler. Sutler is modeled after several real-life dictators. In the film, he speaks to the Council via a large screen with only his head shown, also a deliberate decision to invoke a 1984 Big Brother mood. Also, of all of Sutler's appearances in the meetings, he only blinks once. Dascom is at the BTN network building later that morning, overseeing the news broadcast. Someone asks Dascom if he thinks the public would believe it, and Dascom replies saying BTN reports the news, fabricating it as the government's job. Coincidentally, Evie is also there working as an intern. She watches the news report about the Bailey when her colleague asks her about the night, alluding to Evie's plans the previous night to meet with Gordon, their boss. Finch is at the station with his partner, Dominic, looking over photos of V. Then they get a lead on Evie and set out. Meanwhile, Evie meets with Gordon and apologizes for not showing up to his invite. Later, Evie is delivering packages. When opened, she's surprised to see that they're all filled with fox masks. Finch and Dominic are on their way to BTN. They hurry, as he wants to talk to Evie before the Fingermen get to her, thinking that V could be plotting something. Evie tries to leave. Unfortunately, she's too late, as V appears with a bomb strapped to his chest. 
As V takes control of the newsroom, Finch and the police arrive. Evie moves with the evacuation, but Finch sees her, and she gets spooked. She runs to her room, hides under a table, and Dominic misses her. Television suddenly cut to black. When it reappears, V is in view. When Evie saw Finch and Dominic, she probably thought that they were Fingermen. They prompted her to run. As we'll find out later, Norsefire and the Fingermen play a much bigger role in Evie's life. She's afraid of the very real possibility of her disappearing at the hands of the Fingermen. As Dascom said, people don't trust their governments, but trust the news. Unfortunately, the government in this country controls the news. An ironic twist of fate here is that V is the one using Sutler's tools of oppression to liberate the people. He's also noticeably using something Norsefire also uses to control the people. Fear. A recorded message from V plays, and everyone watching the channel listens intently. V speaks about how the country has decayed, where freedom once flourished, fear now reigns. Streets are now filled with cameras and wiretaps, promoting fear and submission. Injustice, cruelty, and oppression now run the nation. V blames the people, but understands that war and disease had plagued the country, and the people had no choice but to turn to Sutler and Norsefire who promised peace and order in exchange for obedience and complacency. V reveals that it was him who destroyed the Old Bailey to remind the country of the forgotten holiday. V then narrates the story of the gunpowder treason when Guy Fawkes and his co-conspirators sought out the destruction of Parliament. He then makes a declaration and invites those who feel that the government has wronged them to stand outside Parliament building in a year where he plans to rejuvenate the holiday and etch it deeper into the country's history. Disease, death, and war had pushed the citizens to the edge. In desperation, they turned to Sutler for salvation. Maybe the Norse Fire Party originally had good intentions, but would the ends justify the means? It can be seen that the people under Sutler's regime are content. They're living stable lives, but one could argue that they're just comfortable prisoners. The police finally get the doors open, see a masked figure, and shoot it. Finch unmasks the man only to find that the hostages are all wearing masks. In the control booth, Dascom finds a bomb. The police escort everyone out when V reveals himself. He attacks the officers, making quick work of them. Meanwhile, Dascom successfully manages to defuse the bomb. V is on his way out when Dominic catches him and holds him at gunpoint. Evie appears and maces Dominic. Dominic knocks her out, and V disables Dominic. Evie later awakens on a bed, confused. She makes her way out of the room and finds herself in what appears to be tunnels filled with artwork, books, and a myriad of things branded illegal by Norsefire. V appears and welcomes Evie to his home, the Shadow Gallery. Evie realizes what she had done, and immediately regrets it. She intends to leave, but V stops her, telling her she'd surely be taken and tortured by Creedy's fingermen. Evie promises to keep his lair a secret, but V is convinced that the only way to keep both of them safe is to keep Evie confined for a year until the next 5th of November. Evie then shouts at him and leaves. V's home is filled with items that the government has deemed immoral and a threat to the country's stability, but most of the items are works of art, music, books, and sculptures. This is a peculiar detail as artists have long been known to be the first to protest against injustice. The decision to take Evie is rooted in V's humanity. He felt responsible for Evie as she helped him escape. In the source material, Evie is a prostitute, whom V is training to be his replacement. V is also less humanized in the graphic novel, behaving more like an unnatural force or a phantom. Bent on exacting revenge on those who've wronged him, convincing a nation to do better was never his priority in the novel. At the station, Dominic and Finch discover that Evie's parents were in prison and they both had died. Evie's brother had also been one of the first victims of the St. Mary's virus. Evie wakes up the following morning and apologizes to V, but she notices V's scarred hands. V puts gloves on and offers Evie breakfast. Evie asks about the TV broadcast and V says he meant every word of it. Evie doubts that blowing a parliament would do much to convince the people and she predicts everybody would be too scared to show up. V then argues governments should be afraid of the people, not the other way around. He hopes the act of destroying parliament would serve as a symbol for the people. He believes that people give symbols meaning and with enough people, a symbol can change the world. World. Prothero is in his bathroom when V appears behind him. Prothero falls, and V looms over him, calling him commander. Prothero is confused, but V says Prothero was a commander when they met years ago. Prothero suddenly remembers the past. His eyes fill with recognition, regret, then fear. Moments later, he and Dascom are in Prothero's bathroom with Prothero's lifeless body holding a rose. Dascom brainstorms how they should break the news, as he knows the loss of the Voice of London in such a gruesome manner would undoubtedly spark controversy. Dascom's mind is at work again. He's quick to figure out a possible headline for Prothero's death to avoid a public outcry. A little detail about Evie's origin has also been discovered. Her parents were apparently protesters of Norsefire, but she doesn't appear to share the same sentiment. V calls Prothero general and seems to be on a mission to hunt people from his past. Prothero had briefly recognized V, but his eyes were also filled with remorse. It would seem that V is exacting revenge, but not only is he killing those that have wronged him, he's also bent on toppling the empire they have created. Meanwhile, V is busy reenacting a scene from his favorite movie, which awakens Evie. V invites Evie to watch with him, and she agrees. At the station, Dominic discovers that Protheros died from lethal injection. Finch discovered that Prothero is a major stockholder in Viadoc's pharmaceutical. Dominic points out that St. Mary and Viadoc's coming up in their investigation is peculiar. At the Shadow Gallery, news of Prothero's death breaks. Evie gets a chill and asks V if he did it, to which V admits. He reasons out that it was about getting justice. Finch finds Prothero's extensive military records, but finds it odd how he has been mysteriously placed in charge of a detention facility in Lark Hill. He surmises Lark Hill could be the key to their investigation. Later, Evie tells V that she wants to help him with his plight in any way that she can. She tells a story about her parents and how their lives changed when Evie's brother died. Evie's brother died due to the St. Mary's virus, and after his death, Evie's parents became political. One night, they got picked off by Creedy's fingermen and were never seen again. Evie wishes she had been braver like her parents, but she's too afraid. 
V's favorite movie is The Count of Monte Cristo, a story of a man who has been left dead returns to exact revenge on his enemies. V probably relates to this movie as a parallel to his life. Evie tells V she wants to help him. This could be a genuine act as she finally follows in her parents' footsteps. However, this could also just be a means for her to escape V. Later, Evie is granted her request when V asks for her help with his next target. Meanwhile, Finch and Dominic find out that the detention camp had an abnormally high number of doctors, and a priest was the highest paid person in the facility, the same priest on V's list, Bishop Lilliman. At the convent, the bishop is told his request is waiting for him. When he enters the room, Evie, dressed in skimpy clothing, greets him. Evie tries to warn him, confessing everything that's happened to her, but Lilliman makes light of it, thinking Evie's initiating roleplay. Just as he begins forcing himself on her, V breaks through the door. As Evie runs away, Lilliman gets a pistol, but V disarms him. Later, a surveillance van hears Lilliman pleading for his life. Later, Finch and Dominic stand beside Lilliman's corpse when Creedy appears. Finch notices the bishop holding the same rose found with Prothero. Creedy then informs Finch that Sutler demanded Creedy's intervention as Sutler suspects someone from Norsefire could be helping V. Creedy also tells him to cease investigations regarding Lark Hill. Meanwhile, Evie ends up on Gordon's doorstep. Gordon lets her in, and she explains what had happened. Gordon tells Evie not to worry as cops would never suspect her there. To lower Evie's guard, Gordon decides to show her a secret room where he keeps his collection of illegal, banned, or blacklisted items in Britain. He then tells her that the collection would be a bigger problem than Evie if the police were to search his house. The bishop found Evie to be older than his usual request. This could indicate that the bishop could be involved in acts much more sinister. With another one of Norsefire's prominent members dead, Sutler has become paranoid, turning on his fellow party members. Creedy has also asked Finch to stop investigating Larkhill, making Finch more curious about what happened at the facility. It also appears that Gordon is more similar to V in more ways than one. They both hide behind a mask, though V uses his mask to show the world his true self. Gordon uses his mask to hide the truth within himself. Evie then sees several photos of homosexuals on the wall. Gordon then reveals he's a closeted homosexual. Evie gets confused, but Gordon explains that he had invited Evie to supper in his house as it would have been a good way to hide his true sexuality. At a morgue, Finch speaks with Dr. Delia Surridge, and she reveals that Lilliman's cause of death is similar to Prothero's. Finch then hands her the rose V leaves at the crime scenes, and she identifies it as a Scarlet Carson, but she gives a worried look. Later at the station, Finch and Dominic find that V has killed almost everyone connected with Lark Hill except for one. He hurries out upon learning that the woman is Delia. At her home, Delia takes out a diary from her vault. In her bed, Delia wakes, feeling V's presence. Delia talks to V, telling him she didn't know what the people at Lark Hill were going to do to him. When she got involved at Lark Hill, she thought she'd be helping the country, like Oppenheimer. V then tells her that her involvement made the events at Lark Hill possible, and for that, she won't be discounted. He then produces a syringe, revealing that he had already injected her while she slept. V then hands her a rose. Finally, she apologizes to V before closing her eyes. Finch and Dominic arrive mere moments later, but are too late. With Delia's death, we gain a little more insight into what happened at Lark Hill. Hill had done some sort of experimentation on political prisoners, all in search for advancement, or at least, that's what Delia thinks. Her comparing herself to Oppenheimer, the man who created the atom bomb, can be a good peek into her psyche. Oppenheimer's success is built upon the death of hundreds of thousands. Delia also wanted to impact history in such a way, regardless of how many lives were on the line. Also, something of note is V's method of killing. He can easily kill with his hands, or daggers, but he chooses a lethal injection. This could be a form of poetic justice. He's doing to these people what had been done to him. Finch later speaks with Sutler regarding Delia's diary. Sutler appears to know what's inside, and stresses the importance of keeping the contents concealed. He declares that talk of the diary and its content will be treated as an act of treason. He adds that there could be no way for anyone to tell if the diary is legitimate, and not a forged creation from V. The diary narrates what had transpired at Lark Hill some 20 years in the past. The first entry details the first batch of subjects. Delia is excited and optimistic about her involvement as she argues Lark Hill could begin a new age of biological warfare. Nuclear weapons and bombs would be obsolete as a virus could wipe out a country with its wealth intact. She later sees Prothero and Lilliman visit the facility and approve the operation. Soon, 75% of the subjects are dead. One case keeps Delia's hopes alive. The subject doesn't show a negative immune system response. Mutations in the subject's blood seem to have developed tightened kinesthesia, increased physical abilities, and faster reflexes. Sadly, the subject has lost all of his memory. The subject is kept in room 5, marked with a V. On November 5th, at midnight, an explosion destroys the facility. Delia sees the last remaining subject rise from the flames. She feels the subject staring at her, and when he screams, all she hears is pain and vengeance. Now we get a much clearer picture of what happened in Lark Hill. Delia had spearheaded a project to find a new superweapon, a bioweapon capable of bringing a country to its knees. She had also inadvertently created V. V was one of the prisoners in Lark Hill, and as he was experimented on, mutations in his body caused him to develop increased speed, stamina, strength, reflexes, and possibly even intelligence. It appears that V's main purpose is to exact revenge, but it's unclear why he wishes to blow up Parliament. Later, Finch peruses through old news reports, delving deeper into the St. Mary's virus and how it progressed into a nearby water treatment plant called Three Waters. The virus had apparently been a biological attack from a faction of religious extremists opposing the government. 
government. Dominic comes in and notices Finch looking pale. Finch then asks Dominic a hypothetical question. What if the worst biological attack on the country was not the work of religious extremists, but the work of the government itself? That evening, Gordon and Evie watch Gordon's talk show. Gordon says he'd thrown out the approved script from the government and wrote a new one. The show presents a parody of Sutler. A man dressed as V also appears on the show and chaos ensues. Sutler, V, the show's dancers, and soldiers are seen running around to whimsical music. V is unmasked and is revealed to be another Sutler. The soldiers then shoot both of them at their request, and the show ends. People at their homes all laugh and enjoy the show. But Sutler, also watching, is outraged. Evie is concerned about the ramifications of the show, but Gordon assures her everything will be fine. He argues that he'd probably just have to issue a public apology and everything would be back to normal. Finch appears to be coming up with his theory as to what truly happened during the St. Mary's virus spread. Unfortunately, the closer he gets to the truth, the less he wants to find out. Gordon had just written himself into a world of hurt. He's confident that Sutler would just give him a warning and that everything should be back to normal in no time. It appears V had influenced Gordon into making a conscious decision to go against the government. Unfortunately, Gordon fails to remember that no one is safe in Sutler's regime. As Evie put it, people have gone to jail for less. Later that night, Evie is asleep when Gordon busts into her room, telling her to hide. Evie hides under the bed, and Creedy and his men arrive. Evie stares in horror as they take Gordon away. She gets out through the window but somebody grabs her. She then finds herself in a room with a man. The man tells her she'll be sent to death unless she tells them V's whereabouts. She doesn't comply, and gets taken away, gets her head shaved, and gets tortured. She spends days in isolation in her cell until she notices a piece of paper hidden in a hole in the wall. It's a memoir narrating the life of Valerie. Valerie had been born in 1985, and she narrates her early teen years as a lesbian. Valerie became an actress, and moved to London with her girlfriend, where Scarlett Carsons kept their apartment smelling like roses. Unfortunately, Norse fire got in power, and people who were of a different race, gender, or political opinion were rounded up. Her partner, Ruth, was first taken and then she followed not long after. Later, Evie is told she has one last chance left before she's sent to die. The man tells her that she only needs to give them a small piece of information, and she'd be freed. Evie says she's ready to die. The man then tells her that she's no longer afraid and is free to go. Evie is confused and begins walking out of her cell. She sees the guard stationed in the hall as a mannequin, and as she walks further, she finds herself back in the shadow gallery. This is Evie's only time getting a first-hand account of what happened to prisoners. What made Valerie's story resonate with Evie could be the fact that Evie's parents could have potentially been subjected to the same thing. Just as how Valerie slowly lost her will to live, Evie must have also thought about her parents, and how they might have also been stripped of their humanity, and had their will to live torn away. V appears, and Evie is in complete disbelief at what has happened to her. V reveals that it had been all an elaborate ploy. V argues that he'd only done what he did to Evie because he wanted to rid Evie of her fear. Evie shouts at V, telling him he's evil. V reasons that Evie could have stopped everything had she given in and told him V's location. He knows that something had changed in Evie. When V himself was being tortured, he thought he'd die with hate in his veins, but something changed with him, and the same thing had changed in Evie. V had used deception to make Evie realize something about herself. Just as lies can be used to hide the truth, lies can also be used to reveal the truth. In this case, V had lied to Evie to help her find the truth in her. For Evie, it was all true. For her, the government had taken her parents, her brother, and now her. She thought all she had left was her life, but in her cell, she found something greater than herself. Unfortunately, V's process is questionable at best. He had gone through the same and was turned into a killing machine, but what worked for him may not have worked for Evie. Evie appears more broken now than ever. Evie has trouble breathing and requests to go outside. V then leads her up to a balcony where Evie basks in the rain, just as V had been baptized in fire. Evie is also reborn. Later, Evie tells V she intends to leave. V then shows her an altar dedicated to Valerie. V reveals that Valerie was in the cell next to V's at Lark Hill. Evie finally realizes V's plight, and how it had always been about revenge. Revenge for Valerie, for everyone Norsefire had wronged, and revenge for him. V asks her a favor, and that is to meet him on the eve of November 5th. Evie agrees, then leaves. As Evie walks out to the streets, V throws his mask against a mirror and begins sobbing. V cries, but probably not because of what he's done. He may be crying because he had succeeded and is once again alone. V has succeeded in desensitizing Evie. What this means for Evie would only be known once she returns to the outside world. As November 5th nears, Sutler is informed that the best method to blow up the parliament would be through an air attack. Creedy assures him that they're arresting more people, but Sutler lashes at him, expressing his disappointment. Sutler tells Dascom to spread a message of fear, reminding the people why the government is necessary. Soon, news reports are filled with all sorts of news from civil wars in the former United States, to water shortages and sicknesses rising in England. The people, however, are starting to see through the lies. At the station, Dominic uncovers men of interest who had worked under Creedy directly. Finch recognizes one of the names, Rockwood, and checks his email to see that the man had sent him a message. Wanting to find the truth, Finch agrees to meet. They meet at an old St. Mary's memorial, where Rockwood meets them and tells them the truth. The story begins with Sutler being an up-and-coming politician. The more power he gets, the more aggressive his supporters become. Their party then initiates a project in Lark Hill under the guise of searching for a biological weapon, but the true purpose is to round up all individuals the party deems unfit to live in the country, including homosexuals, political protesters, and people of different race. 
Lark Hill burns down, but scientists successfully synthesize a virus and a cure. Creedy then suggests releasing the virus, not at their enemies, but at the country itself. Three waters, St. Mary's, and a train station were chosen for the virus release. Soon, the country is fractured and divided. Amidst the chaos, Sutler rises to power. Soon, a cure is discovered, and it is the Norse Fire Party and Sutler who effectively saves the country. Viadox manufactures the cure with Prothero's help, and as more cures are produced, the party gets richer. Several years later, religious extremists are caught, branded the attackers, and executed. With the people afraid, and Norse Fire swooping in to save everyone, Sutler makes his meteoric rise to Chancellor. The ultimate plan had been launched, and it succeeded with flying colors. The only loose end they forgot to take care of was V. And now, V has returned to undo what they had done. This is the reason why V wants to topple everything that they've built, because it's built on top of piles of bodies. Ironically, it was still them who created their downfall. Had they not included V as one of the subjects, V would not become what he is now, and they would have gotten away with everything. Finch offers to take Rockwood into protective custody, but Rockwood wants Creedy put under surveillance. Only when he feels safe would he resurface. Later that night, V visits Creedy. He offers Creedy a proposition. V assumes there's a growing distrust between Sutler and Creedy, citing the presence of wiretap equipment in Creedy's home. He theorizes that when he finally blows up Parliament, Sutler would need to have someone to blame for the government's failure to stop V, and it would be Creedy. Furthermore, V poses that Creedy probably also knows this and has come up with a plan of his own. Creedy concurs, and V proposes an exchange. V agrees to surrender to Creedy with the condition that Sutler is brought to V. At the station, Dominic and Finch get a call telling them that Rockwood had been dead for 20 years. Finch realizes it was V he had been speaking to. V, pretending as Rockwood, asked Finch to put wiretaps on Creedy, planting the evidence he would later then use to convince Creedy that Sutler is spying on him. Though V had faked being Rockwood, the information he had given may still have merit. Nevertheless, Finch is extremely disappointed in himself for pursuing the Lark Hill incident, rather than finding better ways to find V. Later, Sutler is fuming at their meeting. Creedy tries to reason out, but Sutler doesn't take the excuse and blames Creedy for the failure to capture V. Meanwhile, packages containing Fox masks are being delivered to every house in London. Finch finally sees all the pieces fall into place, and everything that had happened becomes clear to him. With all the chaos, a catalyst would be bound to happen that would finally shift the people's favor away from Norsefire. Sutler would then respond in the only way he knows how to, a show of military might. V would have to do nothing but keep his word and destroy Parliament, further pushing the people against Norsefire. Sutler's arrogance could lead to his downfall. He of all people should know their relationships and politics could turn at the drop of a needle. With him breathing down Creedy's neck, it would only have been a matter of time before something gave in. The chain of events that are now set in motion could have potentially been centuries in the making, beginning with Guy Fox, then to the collapse of the former United States, which then led to Norsefire, accidentally creating V. To V, now on a mission to topple the government, they all fall like dominoes, all leading to one moment. The eve of November 5th arrives, and Finch prepares himself for what could be the country's turning point. At the Shadow Gallery, V is surprised to see Evie fulfilling his request. V says he has a gift for Evie, but asks one last favor before he gives it. A dance. Evie finds the request odd, but agrees when V tells her that a revolution without dancing is a revolution not worth having. At another meeting, Sutler is once again shouting at the lead party members. He says he'd address the people directly. Dascom raises the possibility of V succeeding, and Sutler replies by declaring that if anything were to happen to the building, he'd expect Creedy's immediate resignation. V and Evie dance in the shadow gallery, and Evie finds the irony of V being the most influential person in her life, yet she has no idea who he is and hasn't even seen his face. V says his face is irrelevant as he has lost his identity. It appears that the mask is now who he truly is. Later, Dominic and Finch talk about the excessive military placement outside Parliament. Dominic then drops Finch off near a subway entrance as he'll be searching the underground for any signs of V. V's final request to see Evie was also that he could have one final dance with her. This could be seen as V's way of doing things he had never done in his life. On the eve of his revolution, V only asks that he get to dance one last time. It appears that Sutler and Creedy's relationship has completely broken down. At this point, there's probably not much tying Creedy's loyalty to Sutler. Meanwhile, V shows Evie his gift. They arrive at an underground tunnel where V shows Evie a train filled with tons of homemade explosives. Evie guesses the tracks must lead to the Parliament, and V tells her that the train is his gift. He leaves her the decision whether or not to send the train to the Parliament. When asked why, V answers that the world and the people who had created him will end that night. By the next day, it would be the people who would be in charge of how the world will be shaped, and so the decision to destroy Parliament would be entrusted to the people who Evie represents. V then heads to meet with Creedy, but Evie stops her and begs him to come with him instead, so they could escape and start anew. But V refuses, saying his fate has led him to this. Evie then kisses him, and he disappears into the tunnels. Chancellor Sutler addresses the nation, telling them that anyone found with the mask will be treated as an enemy of the state and would be shown no mercy. He asks the people to remain steadfast and unite against V, but it's shown that nobody is listening to his broadcast. V then meets with Creedy. Creedy's men then drag out a man with a sack over his head, and when removed, a sobbing, snotting, bloodied Sutler is revealed. V approaches and gives him a rose, telling Sutler that everything Sutler had done had finally come to haunt him. Sutler begs for his life, but Creedy takes out his gun and shoots Sutler in the head. V believes that destroying Parliament is the beginning of the people's decision to break free from oppressive government. He also believes that this decision lies with the people, and so he allows Evie to choose, as she is part of the people. Sutler's death is also something to take note of. He had been kidnapped, beaten up, and eventually killed. 
another case of poetic justice, as this could very well have been the same thing the people Norsefire had kidnapped could have gone through in their final moments, and Suttler had experienced it firsthand. V had finally done what he'd sought to do, but Creedy has no intention to let him out alive. V is confident that when Creedy and his men fire upon him, he'd still be standing. Creedy gives the order, and everybody shoots. V gets hailed with bullets, but to everyone's surprise, V still stands after they've run out of bullets. V then begins his attack, swiftly weaving through the men, slicing their throats. Creedy's men fall one by one, but Creedy is left alone. Creedy manages to reload and unload his bullets on V. V takes all the shots, and states that beneath the mask lies not flesh and bone, but an idea. And ideas are bulletproof. He grabs Creedy by the neck, choking him, before snapping his neck. V then stumbles his way back into the tunnels before falling in Evie's arms. V tells her that he's dying, and that he's waited for this moment for 20 years. He then admits that for years, his heart had been filled with nothing but hate. With his dying breath, he tells Evie that everything had changed when they met, and that she had taught him to love once again. Evie wails as V dies in her arms. Meanwhile, the military prepares for anyone to show up near Parliament. People start appearing, and with no response from Creedy or Suttler, the soldiers are left with the hard decision. The people keep approaching, and their commander orders them to stand down. The people then jump the barriers, passing by the soldiers, and continuing their way to Parliament. V had survived being bombarded with bullets by wearing a steel plate of armor. Sadly, other parts of his body were exposed. Creedy had expected to rise to power upon Suttler's death, but V quickly put an end to that dream. The experiments at Larkhill could have also proved useful in V's final battle. His increased stamina, speed, and strength helped him survive. With Suttler dead, the people are now ready to take through the streets and regain their freedom and sovereignty. Evie places V on the train, and Finch arrives. He points a gun at Evie, telling her to step off the train, but Evie refuses, telling him V was right about how the country and the people need to change. Deep down, Finch knows that Evie is right. As the clock strikes 12, November the 5th arrives, and Evie pulls the lever to activate the train, sending V and the bombs to their final destination. She then leads Finch outside to witness the spectacle. Outside, thousands are awaiting near Parliament. The people watch on as music fills the air. Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture once again echoes throughout the streets. Though a crowd now awaits the concerto, no conductor would appear. As the music hits a crescendo, the explosions begin. Parliament is engulfed in fire, and the explosions climb up the clock tower. The crowd watches on, unsure of what the future holds for them in their country. Though they don't know what would happen tomorrow, the choice would be entirely theirs. One man has made sure that whatever they decide to do, it would be of their own volition, by their own hands, and for the betterment of their country. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.